In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of Hosea. We are going to continue our series on Daniel, but right now we're going to take a quick break from that because I was reading in, in Hosea the other day and, and I just thought, man, uh, that really struck me. It re this, this passage of scripture really made an impression on me. And I won't give you context for the whole book of Hosea, but suffice it to say that in this particular passage, God is talking about how Israel has disappointed him, how they have sought after other gods, and how they have refused to listen to him, even though he's given them prophets like Hosea and other prophets over and over and over again, and they have continually ignored him. They've ignored his warnings. They've ignored his pleas to return to a way of life that is in keeping with the covenant that they made with him, keeping the law of Moses, that kind of thing. And God's pretty angry at this point. In fact, God is very fed up with them. And that really comes across in this passage. Let's look at Hosea 4, 14 through 16. I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot or your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with temple prostitutes. So the people without understanding are ruined. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, do not let Judah become guilty. Also do not go to Gilgal or up to Beth uh, Avon, and take the oath, as the Lord lives. Since Israel is stubborn like a stubborn heifer, can the Lord now pasture them like a lamb in a large field? I think the thing that really most jumped out at me when I was reading that verse is the first little part of it, where God says, I will not punish your daughters for playing harlots, and I will not punish you for doing this and not punish you for doing that. And I thought about that, I was like, is God actually threatening to not punish Israel? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what he's doing. Which seems so weird and counterintuitive, but think about that. If you, I know that you had parents or guardians of, of some kind, and if you were like me, you were a stubborn child. Didn't your parents ever have this reaction, at least at some point? Because if you have a kid that is absolutely bound and determined, there is nothing you can do to change his mind, and he wants to do something that you're trying to keep him from doing because you know it's going to be harmful, you know he's not going to like it. I know with uh, in my personal experience, one thing that happened with me is I asked, uh, I asked my grandmother... I wanted to try buttermilk because I knew that she drank buttermilk. And I asked her over and over and over again, I want to try the buttermilk. I want to drink some buttermilk. Will you pour me a glass of buttermilk? So finally, she relented and said, all right, if you're bound and determined to do it. And so she poured me a little bit of buttermilk and she was smart enough to not pour me a full glass. And I took a sip of it and decided I really didn't want to drink buttermilk. Now, that's a harmless thing. But don't you see the same thing with kids if they're bound and determined to do something? Even if it hurts them, or even if it's something that they don't like, sometimes you have to turn them loose. Sometimes you have to just throw your hands up and say, all right, you want to? Go ahead. That's how frustrated God was with them. Because you'll notice in the prophets, and you'll notice in the Old Testament, Normally what happens is God is threatening to punish them. In other words, Israel gets out of hand, they start disobeying God, and God gets tired of them and he says, look, I've held off, I've given you a chance to repent, you haven't done it, so now I'm going to come in and I'm going to set things straight. And You're not going to like it when I set things straight. This is even a step beyond that. Israel had gotten so stubborn and so idolatrous and had turned their backs on God so much 
that God is saying to them, you know what, punishing you isn't even going to do any good. That God is looking at them and saying, I could punish you, not going to help. So you know what? Yeah, go ahead. Do whatever you want. You're not going to like it. It's going to come back to haunt you. It'll bite you. I've tried to warn you about it, but you insist. So you know what? I'm not even going to punish you this time. I'm just going to let you fall prey to your own devices. I'm not going to stop you from doing what you want to do. And now you're going to reap the rewards and I'm not going to be there for you. Now, did God do this permanently? No. If you look back through history and you understand your biblical history, you know that eventually, after God did stop punishing them for a time and let them fall prey to their own sin and fall prey to their own bad decisions, that they did repent, they did come back to God. But it took a while. And it is rare, even in the Old Testament, to see God this mad at Israel. It is rare even in coming from a, a narrative in a time frame where God would literally send fire down from heaven to punish people or hit them with the plague of frogs or, or whatever else. That God is saying, you know what? You guys are too far gone. I'm not even going to punish you this time. I hope, I genuinely hope that I from a personal standpoint, or my country never gets to that point. I don't think we're there yet. I think we're close. I think that if we're going to get to the part, uh, we're going to get to a, a place in this country where eventually God says, all right, if you're bound and determined to do this, go ahead. And if we keep down this path, he is going to turn us loose and we are going to have to reap what we've sown. I hope it doesn't come to that point. But what it really shows here is that even when you don't understand it, or even if you don't necessarily like it at the time, God's punishment is a blessing. God's punishment is something that we really do want, because remember, God is threatening to not punish them. He is taking away the blessing of his wisdom, his foresight, and his correction in Israel's behavior, because he knows that they have got to the point to where it won't matter, where he could punish them all he wants and they're still not going to listen that he is going to have to let them sort of bear the consequences of their own actions for a little while to come back. It's actually very similar to Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. It's a little different in the sense that it doesn't seem as though the, the father was doing exactly the same thing, but there's a similar narrative that plays out, that the father let his son do what he wanted and hoped that one day, once he realized how that was a really bad call, that he would come back to him. And we know that eventually he did, just like Israel eventually came back to God. And you'll notice in the latter part of that verse, and I, uh, you'll, you'll see that this is where my knowledge of Ag actually comes in handy. He talks about Israel being a stubborn heifer. That you can't pasture it around like a sheep. What is he saying there? If you've ever worked with cattle or sheep, and I've done both, sheep are not difficult to move around. If a sheep digs in its heels and, de and decides, nope, not going anywhere. If you're, you know, a, a male, especially over the age of about 12 or 13, doesn't matter what the lamb wants to do. You can make it do what you want. Because it's a little lamb. It's, it's a sheep. Even a really strong, really muscular sheep, and I've had several of those too. I can make them do what I want. If nothing else, I can pick them up and move them where I want them. You're not doing that with a heifer. If you have a heifer and it decides it is not going somewhere, there's not a dang thing you can do about it. I mean, I guess theoretically you could kill it and then you could do what you want to do with it. But the point is, if you want to keep the heifer alive, there's really nothing that you can do because, you know, those animals can weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,000 pounds. If you're 150 or even a 300-pound human, there's not a whole lot you can do if that animal digs in its hills and decides, nope, not go in there. Can't make me. It's different with sheep. And what God is saying is, you're supposed to be the sheep of my pasture. That I care for you, I love you, I take care of you. 
but that works with this idea that you trust me to make some decisions for you, that you trust my wisdom, that you trust my foresight, that when I say something and you don't necessarily understand it right in, you know, there in the second, that you have enough faith in me to say, you know what, God, I'm going to defer to you. That's what a sheep does. And normally that's what a heifer does. But every once in a while, you'll get one that's especially stubborn. And you'll get one that just has decided, doesn't matter what this human does, I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. And that's what God is saying there, that Israel has reached that point. That anything short of actually destroying them, there's really nothing he can do to make them stop sinning. And so he's decided, when you're ready to be my sheep again, let me know. Until then, I'm going to do what any wise herdsman would do, which is just wait until the heifer gets hungry. Wait until the heifer realizes, okay, I actually do need this person. That's how they would react. God really wanted to have that relationship with Israel. He wanted that relationship back. He wanted them to stop doing these self-destructive things. But he realized in his infinite wisdom that to do that, I'm going to have to let them fall prey to their own bad choices. And, and that means for a little while, I'm not even going to try to correct them. I pray that I never get to that point. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus, but I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.